This today is going to be about how our show, Doctor Who, changed the television universe because it really has had great, a great effect in what we see on TV today. And I think people don't even necessarily recognize the power of this one show. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. As we've discussed in the past, and I always do this just because in case there's new people, but you all know me. So you know what I've done and blah, blah, that I have. So I'm going to skip through all this stuff and get to the meat of what we're doing, which is how it changed the TV universe. And I'm going to say right off the bat, we had never done a spin-off that would take place in another country that we would take Torchwood and do Miracle Day, which we all have our opinions on. I'm not a huge fan of Miracle Day, but the idea that they transported a show to another country, right, and got a new staff of people and gave it that different feeling, that's huge, and I've not seen another show do that yet. So the power that they could say, we want to try seeing what would happen if we moved to the States and got this other feeling. So to me, that's always big. And of course, he really wanted to work with Jane Espenson, who I love and adore from Buffy and many other shows. So there was this cross-cultural um, respect for the kind of work that happens someplace else. And he wanted to test the waters of how our American show is done, because we do a writer's room where there's a showrunner and everyone sits in the room and talks all day. In England, they still do a story editor from the network, so BBC or ITV, whatever you're from, and that person is kind of the overall person in charge. They hire a head writer, so our Davies and our Stephen Moffats, mm -hmm. but they talk with them. So it's almost like a team working, and then you hire freelance writers. You don't do a room the way we do. So he wanted, Russell Davies wanted to come and have that experience and see what it would do for his writing, and would he want to bring that idea back to England. And some people there are doing it, but they're still pretty steady in the way they've done. So I think just the idea that they took that chance is really a very fascinating thing. So to me, that's a big step. But let's face it, there is not another show that got a 50-year anniversary on television that was a narrative piece of work. This is not something that can happen. Every time, even when we checked in the hotel the other day and we were trying to explain Doctor Who to the <laughs> lovely women behind the counter, well, how could a show be on the air for 50 years? Mm -hmm. Because the writers were so smart that when, as we all know, Hartnell was feeling ill and they thought, oh no, we're gonna have to stop, they said, wait a minute, he's an alien. He doesn't have to die. He can change completely, which is a beautiful writer's idea, which has given us the chance to enjoy so many different actors over the years, including, of course, Tom. And we've gone all the way through to my favorite is Peter Davison of the old who. And then the fact that they could reboot and be something that children two generations later are still enjoying. So this 50-year thing, let's face it, doesn't happen. And they're going to have a 60th year anniversary. 60 years on television with the same general format. This isn't done. The only other people that have been on the air that long are soap operas <laughs> and game shows. And they stay and stay and stay. The funny thing is, the game shows have had some of the same lead men for all those years. <laughs> it's fascinating when that's a changeover. I mean, sadly, we lost Alex Trebek, so now there's this great changeover, but Jeopardy is not going away. So because they're not narrative, they can continue for all these years. The Simpsons has been on the air for 30 years because they're cartoons. <laughs> Bart Simpson will never grow beyond the age of nine, right? So that's brilliant for them, brilliant for all the actors who signed on to this. And as we know, this was actually a little five minute piece in the Tracy Ullman show. Yeah. So again, an English um, influence in the United States, and then they moved it into being a full on show. So these actors who were just sidekicks on Tracy Ullman and some people don't even remember what they look like have had jobs for 30 years playing Marge and all the people, Madge, excuse me. So I think that's cool. I think it's worth noting that Arthur was on the air for 25 years um, as a PBS show for children, which I think is adorable. My son is now 24. And when they did the finale of Arthur, he and all the kids in his generation were paying attention to the show they'd watched when they were eight because it was Arthur and it was going away. And I thought, how cute is that? So that kind of fan loyalty comes to you when you've been around a long time, again, which is something that Doctor Who has generated. Uh, in researching this, I discovered Scooby-Doo has been around since 1969. So as they say, you do the math. <laughs> However, they would say, exactly, they would say it's, um, it's changed its iterations. There's been Where's Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo, so they've changed the shows, but that set of characters has been with us all this time. This is something amazing if you think about it. Now, in terms of live action shows, again, because an actor is not going to last 50 or 60 years, we don't have that long longevity. Although Columbo, believe it or not, was quite, has quite a long run, and they did the same thing Doctor Who did. They had a little hiatus where it was off the air, 
And then after a while, the audience was still there, and the network said, wait a minute, we could revive this. And of course, Peter Falk was thankfully still around, so they did. So really, that's an amazing run for a narrative show. And um, just a straight show without hiatus has been 23 years the longest as Law and Order Special Victims Unit. So these are amazing things. And then there's Doctor Who. Um, Canonically, when you look at television, Gunsmoke was considered the longest running show, 20 years. Um, and you can see that's actually um, Bert. He started on that show. Um, and then Law and Order was on for a good 20 years. And Supernatural, thinking of science fiction, Supernatural is really the longest running that we've had here in the States at 15, which seems like a lot, but not compared to Doctor Who. So the thing about Doctor Who is that fandom that built over all these years allowed this explosion in cons, which were not a normal thing back in the day, right? They were just what geeky kids did, and nobody took them seriously. Nobody looked deeply into the TV shows they were watching. I think it's a beautiful thing to think how much the support and the fame of Doctor Who has expanded the world of cons. They began as these little tiny things, and we know they began in the world of Star Trek and Trekkies getting together and all of that. It was a very tiny thing. These guys hadn't worked in a few years, so it was like, oh, let's invite them in. They were interested in doing it. It was this little Comic-Con, was this little comic book convention, again, mostly for considered for nerds, if you really loved comic books. And then Doctor Who showed up, and the actors were willing to come to Comic-Con. And the next thing you know, thousands of people are flooding this place. It's almost too big for the convention center anymore because of the power of Doctor Who. And of course, big moment in Comic-Con history, watching David and Jack kiss each other, which is like, oh my gosh, how is that possible? This is amazing, right? And now it's become the kind of thing that every movie studio goes to Comic-Con to show off their new films. This is a huge change. They would not have gone before. They would not have assumed there was an audience there that they cared about. But the Doctor Who audience showed how loyal it could be and was willing to be showing up and buying tickets and showing up, as we know, in cosplay. I mean, we kind of invented cosplay because <laughs> it was harder to do a Star Trek uniform, but it was easier to do all the various Doctor outfits. So I think that's an amazing thing. And we built cons to such a place that they are so respected. Anybody know who's standing there next to Nichelle Nichols? I know. <laughs> Mae Jameson, right? The first female African American astronaut. Sally Ride was the first American astronaut. Um, and she's showing up at a con with the Shell Nichols because she knew the importance of seeing that character on television made her interested in space. So to show up, like she doesn't need to do that. She's got stuff to do, right? She's a scientist. <laughs> this is how cool it is and how wonderful. Now, the other thing about Doctor Who that we know is it went global. And this was not something that happened to very many TV shows. When we were younger and we watched it on PBS, it was because PBS took the leftover stuff from England and didn't make a big deal out of it. There wasn't a big marketing campaign. You landed on it accidentally and went, wow, this is interesting. What is this? And then you got hooked, right? Only shows that have gone global in the past were something like Lucille Ball, who was already sort of known worldwide from her movie career, um, right? Or when we get into the... 80s, Baywatch went global to the whole world. The two most exported shows from the United States, and we were always the country doing the most exports. Always, we went out to 89 different countries. It was much harder for other countries to spread their stuff to us. We had so much on our screens, we didn't need to buy anything else. We filled our broadcast network time. But the other countries had less production, so they were buying all our stuff, right? So Baywatch and Beverly Hills 90210 were the number one and two exports of television from America to the rest of the world. And when I teach students in Los Angeles, I always say, so that means everybody thinks after you go to class every day, you go to the beach and you have a bonfire with your friends and then you grow up to be lifeguards, right? That's a normal LA life, which as we all know, it's not at all. But that's the power of something going global. It brings your culture to another country. Then we rebooted Doctor Who. And even in the David era, it was getting there because David was known from Harry Potter, so there's a fandom there that's bringing it together. But it was this moment when they debuted Matt, they were like, okay, we are gonna make a push in the United States. This is gonna be so important. That billboard is on Sunset Boulevard in LA, where normally it's just a bunch of upcoming movies, right? Or big albums that we expect. So the idea that you could bring this billboard and expect that the people driving by in Los Angeles knew who he was and what that show was. 
That was an amazing step in global television. And of course, Craig Ferguson down there was a Dalek because he's from the UK anyway, so he knew what it was. He was kind of insinuating his love of Doctor Who into, but late, late night. Not everybody stayed up for the late, late night, but everybody drove down Sunset Boulevard. Um, and then the fact that you simulcast the newest Doctor. Simulcast. Because as we got it, we always knew the show aired at this hour, and you got it, and then you had to wait eight hours to see it here, et cetera, et cetera. And then they realized, no, that audience with the internet and the explosion of the internet, there's no possible way we can keep the secret. It's going to disappear before we have the chance to enjoy it. So they literally put in the effort to simulcast that moment of changing the character, changing an actor on a show. How could that become so important? Because it's Doctor Who. <laughs> I think that's really cool. Now, slowly, because of Doctor Who, it's that long tail thing. Now, other shows are being able to sort of jump on that bandwagon, and people are saying, oh, let me look at that. So, for instance, of course, there's the new All Creatures Great and Small. What I love is, all of a sudden, by accident, some of the shows I chose as examples, they all have connections to Doctor Who. Right? So for instance, this is the new All Creatures Great and Small, but in the top corner I have the original All Creatures, which I watched on PBS originally, and that's connected to Doctor Who because Peter Davison came to us from that show and then moved into Doctor Who, so I think that's fun. And actually the bottom picture is how much fandom gets you. When we happened to be lucky enough to go to an event in Leeds, we took a train to Thirsk, and that is the home of James Harriet, and that is the James Harriet Museum. It's the smallest and most popular little museum in the whole of, of that section of England. And it was kind of fun, and they had a little area where they showed you the set from the original show, because we were here before the new show had started. So I'm kind of interested to know how they've expanded their museum. But that's the power, right, of now globalizing the story. Whoops, went backwards for a minute, didn't mean to do that. Of course, we know Down Abbey became this huge explosive. Again, filmed in England, telling us a very culturally English story with an English cast. And that has a Doctor Who connection because Hugh Bonneville shows up after that on Doctor Who. That's how powerful now Doctor Who is this worldwide, let me see, let me have everyone see me here, right? So I think that's a beautiful connection. Sherlock went global. And it has its Doctor Who convention, a connection, because we know it was written by both Moffat and Gaddis, who a lot of people don't take seriously or don't realize he's more than an actor. He's also a writer. Um, he actually has a wonderful, um, it's still on YouTube, it's a three-part uh, documentary on his love of American horror films. And so he goes to the history of early horror films, the classics here, and then he does one about the modern, and in the middle he does one about English horror films. But it's a three-part really fun piece. Um, and I show that to students and they recognize him from Sherlock, but they don't know that he wrote it. Right? People forget that part. We tend to forget that actors are sometimes also writers. The same thing happens when I, I teach something with Emma Thompson. She wrote Sense and Sensibility and then won the Oscar for that, and people don't realize that. She wrote the Nanny McPhee movies, so she adapted the books into film and also starred in them. So Sherlock has gone global. Again, the books always did, but shows done earlier no one had paid attention to in the same way. Of course, our Doctor Who connection to Victoria is that it was the next piece that Jenna Coleman did. And that became something that everybody was paying some attention to. So the power of Doctor Who and for all these characters is amazing. Since that, other, of course, shows have exploded more. We were talking with some folks the other day about these guys. But you start with Inspector Morse, which, again, was on PBS in the 70s. And then that became the spinoff of Lewis. So Lewis, who is the original assistant, now becomes the head guy. And there's a Doctor Who connection because the guy who played Hathaway was married to Billy Piper. Luckily, apparently, they're divorced now because he's gone crazy. <laughs> he's a little, little, has the issue. That was husband number two? I don't know if it was two. Not, yeah, not one. So maybe. I have to go double check that. And then, of course, they blended that into doing the prequel, The Endeavor Show, which is really Morse as a young man because right? his real name was Endeavor, but he never liked that as a name, so they used it for the new show. But now that's something that Americans know a lot about. I have friends who had never heard of Morse, but they all watch Endeavor. And so then they're like, oh, let's go backwards and see what this guy, you know, what happens to him later in life. The other new trend that's happening is because of this internationalism, Call My Agent is a French program. And you can see it on Netflix with subtitles. England did their own version of it. So they bought the formula of the show, and it's called 10%, because that's agents take 10% from you. These are shows about agencies, they're talent agencies in their country. And it's the soap opera-ish of what's the lives of the talent agents, 
But the trick is that their clients who come to their episodes are real actors in those countries, pretending to have problems with these fake agents. It's the cutest. And as you start watching, you're like, well, I know that person. And they're using their real name. And then you realize, oh, that's the gimmick. Right? So now we have Call My Agent. We have 10%. Minari Ara is actually from Turkey. They have a Turkish version of it. And Call My Agent Bollywood is the Indian version of it. So this is becoming a whole new trend. Oh, that's a style that works. Let's show it. But also, let's do a version in our own country because we want to have our cultural spin on it, which is a new blend. Um, we've been watching a lot more Korean TV also because of the streamers and network. And so it's really interesting to see, again, the transmission of their culture to other places. I think that's really fun. Um, but here's a point. Because of the popularity of Doctor Who and now this idea of blending formulas, there was a conversation about should there be an American Doctor Who? And they quacked it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. No, no, no. Because it's so powerful as it is, we already know so much about it, we would not, it isn't American. Like, you couldn't imagine seeing an American dude do that. That's not our story. It is the myth of the UK. It's really, that's what I loved about the Robin Hood episode with Peter Capaldi, where in the end it's like, well, I'm a myth, and so perhaps are you. <laughs> and I do think that's true. He is so incredibly English that it couldn't possibly, I, I wouldn't imagine seeing that any place here. Cruise and the TARDIS. Yeah, ooh, ooh, yeah, that already goes, no, 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 it's not funny. I really, and you know that's what they were talking about. Can we take this formula? Can we do it here? How would we do it? It, just, it wouldn't so work. this is what the inside of the TARDIS looks like. <laughs> and it's a lot bigger because Tom Cruise is a lot shorter. Minimize. <laughs> <laughs> Minimize, they would have to change the set. So I think it's interesting that they brought that idea as they see it working with other shows, but the power of Doctor Who is that, no, 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 it is its own thing. It can only ever be this thing, and as it is, it travels everywhere in the world. So I think that's pretty cool. Now, it's also something we talked about the other day. It certainly broke ground on a thing that's being talked about a lot in LA and around the world. The BBC came to inclusive casting first. They really came to the idea that we need to showcase all the people in our country inside this show that is claiming to be all about England. So if you think about it, Mickey and Rose showed up, and Mickey himself just being the first uh, character of color to come into the Who world. And what's interesting about their, their relationships when you see them, their change in race is not what causes any issues in their relationship. In America, that's always the question. Oh my God, it's a problem. After a while, like either you're together or you're not. That can't be the one thing you have a problem about, right? This was never their problem. Their problem was she wanted to go adventuring and he didn't. <laughs> he wasn't quite ready. But of course, in the lovely writing, he grows to be ready, right? We get to see him become this three-dimensional guy, which I love. But they beat America. Grey's Anatomy's on the same on the air the same year that Mickey and Rose show up in Doctor Who. But we don't have quite the same inclusion yet. Um, we're gonna, even we're 10 years before Hamilton, and Hamilton makes a big deal out of now we've done this really interesting inclusive casting, right? Doctor Who is 10 years ahead of Broadway. I think that's a pretty big deal. Um, it's 2007, we're gonna get Martha, all right? And that's a big deal, because now we're having a character that doesn't have to be a love relationship. She's her own individual with her own powers. And as we've seen and discussed the other day, many times saved him was necessary. Not always did we have that in the earlier companions, right? They were always being saved by the doctor. So we're moving into this other area. Um, and of course, she was supposed to grow up to be in unit, but then she got the job on the Law and Order made in England. So she couldn't do unit, all right? So taking our Law and Order franchise and putting it over there, and then she took that job, which is fine. Also, and this is probably one of my favorite Christmas episodes, again, because we're doing this inclusive thing, but also what a great mimic of what the show was at the time and what this, you know, what his his dream idea was, but she also saves their lives together, right? She's a useful, complete character, which is really fun. Of course, as we know, in David's final episode, he shows us that Martha and Mickey got together. And I think it's really interesting. This is an example of production and how you have to take production together. <laughs> oh, you didn't get there? Oh, no. Spoiler alert. I'm so sorry. Spoiler. Spoiler, sweetie. Spoiler, sweetie, yes. Well, it's, it's a little bit, right? At the end of David, he sees kind of all his old companions, and he has a moment with them before he goes. And what happened was um, he was going to have them do separate things, separate days, but the two actors were only free on this one morning together. 
So he was like, well, I have to use them both in the same four-hour period. How sweet if we have Smith and Jones get married. And in his mind, he was married. He was mar Pardon me? No, not laughing. I'm laughing. Yeah, he was, gonna, he was marrying Smith and Jones. What, yeah, which turned out really sweet, except the funny thing is he did get some flack from people saying, oh, no, you, you've told us that only people of color can marry each other. And he's like, no, I'm telling you two actors are only free one morning for four hours, and this is the best I could do. So it's a nice example of, of how a producer has to work with also production schedules. Because that episode had like all the companions. It was very busy filming. Um, of course, I think it's marvelous that we had Mel show up. I think she's a cool character. I wish we had seen more of her. Really like the actress as well. Um, and we know she's actually our favorite person. <laughs> she, which, but that was, a great, like, that was a great way to use that to confuse us. Um, and of course, then we've brought ourselves up to the modern day with Joe which is kind of an amazing thing that they've, very, they've just done very organically. It's not really, it's not bashing the stories together. They just organically make sense. So I think that that is something Doctor Who has certainly done in a way that many shows have not done so nuanced and normally. It doesn't have to be a big deal. It is just who we are. This is England today. This is the UK today. And as I said yesterday, Three people of color in the original show, in the original episode for Jody. That's a huge, and just organically who they are, right? And I really think watching Ryan and Graham have to try to like each other over time was, was about step parents, but then also parenting when you're older. I don't need a parent. I'm a grown up. Yeah, but I want to be there in your life. I want to help in some way out of honor to the person that I loved. That was a nice little relationship. Again, three dimensionally, all about really people getting to know each other. And in that case, about men thinking about what's family. And what kind of nurturing do I need in life? And why should I turn down being nurtured? Why is that? No, 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 I'm over. I, I think they really dealt with masculinity. Very interesting in the show. Still working with them on, on the bike. They were still. Yes, exactly. At the end, that he helps him with that, which still I think working. is really beautiful. Yeah. To me, that's, I, I loved watching that. You know, the awkwardness, and yet eventually they came together because of working together. And we all know that's how we get to know each other and be comfortable with each other. And that's something Doctor Who has always done really well. Um, you know, I love the whole beginning Sarah Jane and then let's bring her back with David and then having to make choices and then we move into the Sarah Jane adventures and then it's her chance to nurture a whole new generation of young kids. I just think that's brilliant. So I think the, that what they've achieved has been really, um, really beautiful, frankly. The other thing that Doctor Who did was it brought a new respect to writing on television. I really felt bad when I first got into the business. We would say TV writers were hack writers. They weren't good enough to be movie writers. Now the business has grown a little. We've seen people do movies and TV shows, go from TV to movies. It didn't used to be acceptable. It was like, oh, no, no, that's like the B level and the A level are movies. But I had a couple of people I knew that I had worked with in the past who you could write five or six movies and make money, but the movie never got made. They bought the script, but they never greenlit it to actually be filmed. But if you work in television, they suddenly realized if you write a script one week, two weeks later it's being filmed, two weeks after that it's on the air. You can hear actors say your words out loud. And that, of course, is what a writer really wants in the long run. So movie writers started to migrate into television, and suddenly it was very respectable. There's a new, new wave of excellent television from The Sopranos on down. So the fact that Moffat could go to Neil Gaiman, who was a respected novelist, and who had had work adapted by other writers and didn't enjoy seeing other people adapt his work. But nobody thought, oh, a novelist, you can't write television. All right? So he wasn't getting the respect he needed. And then he did The Doctor's Wife. <laughs> it was such a great episode. And again, so many years on the air, nearly 50 at that point, no one had ever thought of that idea. You needed that new brain to come in and see where haven't we gone with this character. I just think that's a brilliant episode. So bringing Neil into the show, of course, and he was famous for American Gods. I just like the cat in the picture. But, um, and Sandman, which was his favorite piece. By doing that episode of television, now the television network was like, oh, you can be part of a show. Maybe we should let you adapt your own work into a new show. Right? And Doctor Who gave him that platform so that, of course, we got to the Sandman, um, which has been really fun to watch. And interestingly enough, knowing he'd never run a show before, he did ask for a showrunner, and he got one from the United States, a guy named Alan Heinberg, who, has writ who wrote the, last, the, first episode, uh, the first Wonder Woman movie. And, uh, and he asked 
Alan to come to the UK and live for half a year and work on Sandman with him. Um, Alan came out of the Shonda Rhimes world, so he had worked on several of her shows. So he completely knew how to run a show, having learned from her. So it was a beautiful move in his career uh, to move over and do this first season of Sandman. Um, and I'm very lucky because he speaks to my MFA students um, and tells us all about his career. So it's really quite a special thing. So I was very happy that Sandman was successful. She's so brilliant. She's I know. Awesome. She can smack them down. Exactly. So seeing that emergence of now it's reputable to write television. It's something cool to do, right? I think that's very cool. So if we go back a moment, we also, way back in the day, don't even realize the importance of Doctor Who writers to American TV long before they knew what Doctor Who was. Terry Nation, who gave us the Daleks, also gave us MacGyver. He was in on the planning for that character. And one of the things he brought to that show was the fact that if the doctor never used a gun, why can't this guy in the States never use a gun? And the cool thing about MacGyver was he always used his brain, which is what Doctor Who is all about. Right? So I've loved that idea. Of course, we recently rebooted MacGyver, so that idea, that character has been so popular, he's come back. But this is the effect that Doctor Who has been having all across, across time and space, <laughs> which I think is lovely. And then um, I just thought this was the cutest joke. I read the introduction to this uh, new book that was celebrating the 50th anniversary of Doctor Who. The introduction was written by Stephen Moffat. And I was reading it the other day, and he said he took credit that the show brought police boxes back into the modern culture. Because frankly, they haven't been used in years. Young children in England should have no idea what a police box is. Nobody has that, right? We all have these. Just bring this with you and call the cops if your car breaks down. Um, so now, children know what this thing is in a way that even in the States, we've been exposed to what this thing is, right? Of course, um, because Big Bang Theory made such a deal out of the TARDIS and Doctor Who in general. At a time when they have these lovely videos on YouTube where they have children try to use things from the past, they don't know how to make a payphone work. They don't understand what it is, but they know what a police box is <laughs> because they watch Doctor Who. <laughs> what a ridiculously cute way to bring the past to the present, which of course was always the plan behind Doctor Who, to bring the past alive for children to understand. And it just grew to be such a much bigger thing than a history program for children on Saturday morning. I think that's beautiful. So to me, Doctor Who has changed the television universe immensely. And I'm very happy for that, both for people in the business and for people who are enjoying television. There's so much more to enjoy because of the existence of Doctor Who. Thank you guys for coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs>